Testing and Accountability Subcommittee. Uh, a major purpose of today's meeting is for us all to better understand the various roles and responsibilities of some of the stakeholders, most notably the state board's role and responsibilities, the Department of Education, uh, the legislators, and the federal government, and then how those responsibilities will drive future actions for the state board. Certainly want to encourage uh, uh, open dialogue and discussion with the board members and our other panelists. And uh, as we consider uh, the responsibilities that we have down the road and start looking at those, we certainly want to hear feedback from our other stakeholders, the public, the teachers, the students, uh, and the districts. Certainly how we impact or how we implement testing accountability, particularly in this world of COVID, will play a major role as we continue our path forward to, to continue to improve education for our students. And so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Sarah. Thank you, Bob. Not much for me other than just a quick thanks to our partners at the Department of Education. We're so glad that the commissioner and members of her team can be with us today for this conversation and uh, appreciate the work that you all have done to prepare some of the information that we'll share and discuss today. Uh, like Bob said, I think you know, we all have a lot of questions about testing and accountability this year in particular because of the health crisis. And uh, I think it'll be important today to have some really um, you know, more detailed discussion about the, the decision points that are ahead of us as a state and where the decision-making authority lies and what work the state board can do um, in support of our educators and our schools and our districts right now to ensure that we have information that is meaningful about student learning that helps to drive decisions across the state and that we also really take into account um, accountability decisions in the context of this year. Uh, so I'm looking forward to the conversation and appreciate everybody's work to prepare for today's meeting. And I'll turn it over now to Amy Owen, our Director of Research and Policy, who's going to kick us off, I believe. I can't unmute myself. It was that you're muted, but I heard your voice. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, it's not, it's showing me that I'm not muted. It's still showing me that I'm muted, but if you can hear me, that's fine. Sorry about that. Um, thank you, Bob and Sarah. I'll quickly go through the agenda for today's call. We will start with Commissioner Schwinn providing some introductory remarks about school and district accountability this year. I will then go through a short presentation defining, as Bob said, the roles and responsibilities of the federal and state government and different agencies when it comes to district and school accountability policy. We'll then have Dr. Eve Carney from the department review with us uh, the requirements that, the, uh, that we have in our ESSA plan with the federal government. And then we'll hear from the department with some updates on annual measurable objectives, which will be coming up to the November board meeting and a brief discussion of fall and of course assessment plans. And after that, we'll have plenty of time for open discussion with board members and staff before we adjourn. But as Bob said, please do feel free to ask questions along the way. So with that, Commissioner Schwinn, thank you. Uh, nice to be here on the call uh, this, this morning. Um, I'm going to keep my remarks brief because I know um, there's some really good information coming around roles, responsibilities, requirements, um, and both the state board staff as well as the Department of Education staff have some good updates um, on all fronts related to assessment um, and in, in some respects accountability. I think just to frame in terms of the department and the space that we are in now, um, we are in um, in some cases, 11th week of school for some districts and in the you know, fourth or fifth week for others. And so certainly are well into the throes of the beginning of the school year. I think given that we've had an opportunity and I've been in um, gosh, over two dozen districts uh, in just in the last several weeks. And it's, I think it's really helpful as we are in more schools and talk to more stakeholders to see the challenges as well as the success stories um, in our school reopening. People have been working hard all spring and summer to make sure that the 2020-21 school year is a success for students, that students, regardless of the seat they are in, have access to a high-quality education. 
And we also know that in that conversation, it's going to be important to know where our kids are. When we think about assessment and separate that from the accountability conversation, um, I've heard a lot of shared, um, shared conversations around, we want to know where our kids are. We want to know what we might need to do to help them to continue to progress, to continue to accelerate the achievement um, as we have been doing for years here in Tennessee. And um, I think that there's, there's um, an, an incredible value in that. And I think a real commitment um, from, uh, certainly from the department to ensuring that we can, we can know how our kids are doing. Um, separately, and I think this is some of the um, kind of compilation of, of conversations around assessment, is there are some real logistical conversations we need to have. Um, certainly, we've invested in the paper and pencil test, and I think there's a lot of, um, a, a lot of uh, reasons why, from a financial perspective, that's important. But logistically, as we have remote and in-person learning, um, thinking through um, how we support districts in terms of flexibility and scheduling while still maintaining test security, those are really robust conversations that we've had with superintendents. Um, we had some engagement groups last week to be able to talk about that really critical conversations about how do we facilitate this process in a way that works for works for everybody. Um, and so I, I think um, in terms of conversations around assessment, really focusing on the how, how do we make it work so that we know where our kids are at. Now, in terms of accountability and evaluation, um, a, a couple of things, and I know that the, um, you'll go into this around roles and responsibilities, and certainly the department is positioned um, and will always do uh, whatever is voted on by our legislature. Um, and I know that those are robust conversations that continue. We've had conversations in the past weeks. We expect those to continue in the subsequent weeks related to the direction um, and vision that certainly is held by our elected officials in relation to accountability and evaluation. I will also say, um, just from a, the practitioner perspective and what we're seeing in schools each and every day, this is a year that is unlike any other. Um, educators and principals and superintendents and district staff are working incredibly hard to navigate um, a constantly changing situation. We were in some schools yesterday where we saw teachers who were teaching um, just in person, teachers who were just teaching um, in a remote setting, and teachers who were doing both at the same time. And on top of that, those same teachers having to be flexible with maybe moving to full remote, then back into the classroom, having students in their classrooms change, et cetera. And when we think about what accountability and evaluation is intended to do, um, it is intended to be a summary of a performance um, of that of a person's work or certainly of a school year. And when we think about this year, it is it is a year unlike any other. I think we have not seen anything in the past that's been like this, and I think optimistically we don't expect that this will continue. And so, um, given that, um, really hoping that as we facilitate and navigate these very difficult conversations, we keep in mind that the priority for our state has got to be um, on our students, making sure they have every opportunity to learn as much as possible um, in the strongest environment possible for each and every one of them, and that we are supporting our educators to um, continue to do the hard work that they've been doing all year. Um, and so certainly, if that is the priority, I think knowing where our kids are at, continuing to support the excellent instruction that happens every day in our classrooms, that is that has got to be the focus area. And then just remembering, um, I think that there needs to be a lot of flexibility, um, empathy, and certainly um, robust conversations about what is and frankly what is not appropriate in the other realm. Um, that will continue to be a statewide conversation. I know um, our legislature and certainly the federal government all have to weigh in on those. But um, I just I want to just remind us as a group um, and as a state of, of folks um, across the state who care deeply about our kids, our educators, and our schools. Um, that at the end of the day, this is about a relationship between a student and the teacher um, that, that is teaching that child. And if we keep that front of mind, front of heart in terms of how we're making decisions, um, I think that that is going to be the best way forward. Um, and I certainly hope that we continue to have robust conversations about what accountability might be this year. Um, it's certainly an evaluation and what is and is certainly not appropriate, um, given that this is going to be, uh, again, kind of an anomaly year. All of us are in our first year um, in our jobs in this, in this respect. Uh, my sister says that to me a lot. I'm a first year teacher. Again, I've never done this before. And so I think um, that's going to need to be incredibly important as we think about the best way forward and, frankly, some flexibilities that um, I am very uh, hopeful we explore um, and, and some of the ways that we um, take all of that into account about what we should be focusing on when we think about these precious instructional days and everyone who's been working hard to make sure that we maximize time with kids. Um, so with that, I will turn it back over to um, the State Board and just want to say 
um, a, a very special thank you. Um, it has been, we've been working very closely together for a number of months on some very difficult topics. Um, and I just want to say to the board members who are on here, um, I think uh, have been so impressed with the way in which they've been able to navigate some of these challenging policy conversations and the level of communication that we've had. So a lot of appreciation um, to, to their good and hard work. Um, and it's nice to see everyone this morning. Commissioner, and uh, I certainly enjoyed uh, going to La Follette Middle School with you and, and the fact that you're getting out to the, to the classes and you've visit as many districts as you have, I think shows the importance that you put on, on the students. And I think the words that you just said about the priority for the, being the students as we go forward is, is, is right on. Let me see if there's uh, questions from uh, uh, Daryl. I know Daryl is on now and, and uh, Nick or Lillian or any, any others. Questions for the commissioner. I have a question, but I certainly do appreciate your comments regarding the partnership and the collaboration. We talk about this often, and we certainly look to you and your team to be great partners in all of this work and collaborating with us. And so thank you so much for your comments. And I'm looking forward to being with you next Wednesday for at least one school visit. I think there are two that are kind of sort of converging, but I'm looking forward to that opportunity. So thank you for that. Me as well. Okay. Uh, if no questions, uh, I think the questions will probably come as we get into more details on the, the roles and responsibilities. So I think the commissioner has teed it up well. Uh, I'll turn it back or turn it over to Amy now. Back to Amy. Thank you, Bob. Um, hopefully y'all can hear me. We're good? Great. Yep. I think that that was a really great introduction and leads well into this discussion of which agencies and which levels of government have decision-making authority in areas of testing and accountability this year. For today, we're focusing on district and school accountability. There are definitely conversations to be had about teacher and administrator accountability, things for students. We'll get into a little bit of that today, but really just wanted to focus on district and school accountability first. Um, it's just a topic we can get our hands around before we start getting down into those individual level decisions. So this, the impetus for this presentation is that we often get questions from board members and from the public of, this is such a strange year. Can't you just kind of wave your hands and make a lot of these requirements go away? And the answer is honestly no, because there's a lot of different levels of government and requirements wrapped up in school and district accountability. And so we wanted to lay the groundwork for what those expectations and requirements are so that you as board members can see where your role slots in and then how it interacts with others that are in this space as well. So starting off at the top, the U.S. Department of Education, as I'm sure we all know, has the federal law Every Student Succeeds Act, which is the current iteration of the Elementary and Secondary Education Act. Under that law, state plans had to include the following components that are listed there, academic standards, annual testing in certain grades and courses, school accountability, goals for student achievement, plans for supporting and improving uh, what they call struggling schools, and state and local report cards. Today we're really focusing on the accountability piece of this, although F several other components will be mentioned as well. To date, the U.S. Department of Education has indicated that they will not be waiving assessment requirements for this school year. The state of Georgia asked recently and received a letter from the U.S. Department of Ed saying that that was um, not something that they were planning on having occur. So that's what's uh, kind of going on at the federal space. Any changes to Tennessee's ESSA plan would also require federal approval. And you'll hear more in the next presentation from Dr. Carney at the department about exactly what are the requirements in our current ESSA plan. So that's what we have at the federal level. Questions so far? I did also want to mention that school accountability has to include, at a minimum, disaggregation by student subgroups and include both student achievement and growth, English language proficiency assessments, high school graduation rates, and one additional measure, Tennessee uses chronic absenteeism and the ready graduate indicator. And the testing required at a minimum is math and ELA in grades three through eight and once in high school, and then science once in each grade band. So those are the minimums from the feds, but Tennessee has additional components in its ESSA plan, which would also have to see, receive federal approval um, if those are gonna be changed. Next, we have our partners at the Tennessee General Assembly. So this is getting into state law. 
State law requires the use of a value-added assessment system, um, which we use as PBOS. And it requires an A2F grading system and a comparable system for districts, for schools and for districts. That state law was passed in recent years and has not been fully implemented yet due to several years of testing challenges and various difficulties that had occurred. It was set to occur um, for, based on data from this past school year, but obviously testing did not happen due to COVID-19. There are several parts of state law that have additional requirements for state assessments. Um, they indicate that the commissioner sets the schedule for assessments. So that's, again, something the department did in the Tennessee ESSA plan, and then that went to the U.S. Department of Ed for approval. So you can see where this gets murky really quickly. There's a writing assessment that's required at least once per grade band, and the department's required to list all state-mandated tests and dates online. There's a lot of other components of the state law that deal with assessment and accountability. This is just an example. So in terms of waiving any of the requirements listed here or changing them, that would need to come from the Tennessee General Assembly. The state board and the department would not have the authority to waive these things independently. Now, of course, if they did choose to take action this school year as they did last school year to make some changes, we would be ready to introduce any rule of policy changes necessary to come into compliance really quickly. Amy, I have a question. Yes, sir. So uh, the federal government uh, requires an assessment, right? Yes. And, and the Tennessee General Assembly requires use of a value added assessment uh, is what, how, we, how we assess. If the federal government were to give a waiver on assessments, would it still require us to go to the state to get a waiver on value added assessment or does that cover? So that? The value-added assessment system, it's the same test. It's both based on PCAP. Right. Uh, so if the federal government said, you do not have to have a test at all this year, is that what you're asking? Yes. Uh, uh -huh. The General Assembly would also, I assume, and I would defer to Angie on this, um, need to address requirements about using the value-added assessment system. Now, if there's no test at all, there's nothing to generate PBOS scores. So it's not so it's not automatic. It would still have we it would still have to go and, and the General Assembly could come back and say, Well, we want an assessment done this way or, or whatever. I believe so. Um I'm happy to follow up with you, Charlie or Angie. If either of y'all know, you're welcome to jump in here. Um I believe that's right, Amy. If the federal government granted a waiver, the um legislature would still have to come back and act similarly to uh, what they did last year and uh, pass a law saying those assessments did not need to occur. Thank you. And this gets tricky quickly. So now to the state board's role. There are two statutes here that really work together. One requires the state board to set performance goals and measures for schools and districts, including student achievement, student growth, and other indicators of performance. Then there's another one that directs the state board to set policies for, me for measuring the educational achievement of individual schools. Together, that means that the state board approves annual measurable objectives. Those are those performance goals and measures. Approves performance levels and cut score designations for state assessments. So this happens whenever we have a new version of a state assessment. So for example, if standards change in one area and the assessment is changed to align with the new standards. Um, the cut scores would actually come before the board for a vote. There's a process that involves both really sophisticated psychometricians, but also Tennessee educators who are giving their value judgments on um, where a student who's at the level of on track would be, where would be mastered, where would be um, approaching. And then those performance level designations and cut scores come to the state board for approval. Doesn't happen every year, but happens when a test cut undergoes a revision. And then the state board also approves school and district designation lists. This would be our reward and priority schools um, and our list of district designations. Those are things that the board actually has come before you for approval. In addition, the statute on A2F grading allows the board to review the grading scale that the department develops for those grades, but there's not a formal approval authority there. Questions on the state board side here? question. It's just a, a clarification. In um, Together, these laws mean the state board approves, and, and every word there at the beginning is 
approves. And so that's our role. The data comes from the department. And so I just wanted everyone to be clear on that distinction. I think most of us who have been on the board for a while understand that. And perhaps there could be someone listening from the uh, public that's not uh, aware of that. So I just wanted to have that distinction made. No, I really appreciate that, Madam Chair. That's a great point. Um, the department does, as we'll see on the next slide, manage all of the student data that comes in. The state board uh, does not own or necessarily even have access to that data unless we set up a separate um, MOU process, which we do not currently have, um, because we also have a staff of 14. <laughs> so we don't have the full-time assessment experts and data experts that the department does. So they develop these lists and recommendations and bring them to the board for approval. Amy, this is Sarah. I don't want to go down this rabbit hole right now, but I just want to bring it to the attention of our members in particular in terms of just one additional area of responsibility for the state board. Um, the law gives us the ability and responsibility for setting the percentage um, for which an EOC, an end of course assessment, would count in a student's grade for the semester as well. This is a little bit inside baseball, but this is something that we're going to need to think about as well. Right now, our policy sets it at 15 to, I believe, 25 percent for grades 9 through 12. And this is just another area that we will want to um, be thinking about in terms of the action the board may need to take. But we can we can get to that as we discuss later. I just wanted to flag that for board members in terms of for the purpose of student grading, um, which is a little bit outside of what you're talking about here. There is some additional responsibility for the board to consider. Yes, and we will come across that a little bit when we talk about fall EOC administration um, a couple presentations from now, but that's absolutely right. And like I said, this presentation is really focusing on our role in school and district accountability. We do, of course, have rules about educator evaluation um, and, and policy to that effect as well. Finally, the department has uh, quite a lot of work in this area in terms of designing field testing and administering the annual state assessments for all student groups, which is not just TN ready, it would also include making sure that the WIDA access assessment is available for students who are English learners, um, certain students with disabilities take an alternate assessment, so it's really that full and comprehensive assessment program. The department establishes requirements for the state assessment schedule, so when are these tests actually administered, both during the year and then also how often, um, that's part of our ESSA plan, we go a little bit farther than the requirements in federal law recommends the performance levels and cut scores to the state board, and develops the HRF grading system. I know in recent years the department has had, had a lot of working groups and stakeholder engagement thinking about what that system could and should be, and that is um, something that has not yet been able to be implemented because of a lot of circumstances like COVID and other prior testing issues. The department also produces the annual state report card, which I believe was just updated with new data in the last couple weeks. Um, to share the ESSA required data with uh, on school and district results, but also new components that ESSA introduced on school and district finance, as well as other factors about number of teachers, number of students, demographics, and so forth. The department developed the ESSA plan, and you'll hear from the expert on that in just a minute with ease, which does include how we arrive at those lists of school and district designations um, and grades. They take care of federal reporting on progress towards the ESSA plan, and they can work with the federal government on requesting waivers or revisions of the plan. And then they assist school and schools and districts that are identified as in need, in need of improvement and support. They have school improvement grants and other opportunities and resources, such as the core offices, um, that you'll also hear more about in just a little bit. So questions or comments here. Is that helpful to really define who does what in this space? it's very helpful, Amy, because there's so much that's got to get done, and it requires interrelations and interacting and working together but to see who's responsible, ultimately responsible for which activity, I think, lets us know who's going to be driving that activity. That's good. Well, then you're in for a treat to hear all about the Every Student Succeeds Act from uh, Dr. Eve Carney. And Eve, I'll advance the slides for you. I'll try to anticipate you, but feel free to direct me as well. Thank you, Amy, and good morning, everyone. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to be with you this morning, adding to what was a really helpful uh, framing for the conversations in this 
presentation and the ones of my colleagues to follow. Uh, so in addition to um, the state statute and state board rules, um, as Amy just alluded, there is also a requirement uh, and there is uh, accountability for states at the federal level uh, that is currently in the Every Student Succeeds Act. So a little bit of history, December the 10th, 2015, uh, President Obama passed the Every Student Succeeds Act, um, repealing uh, the elementary and secondary education act, uh, as well as No Child Left Behind, which was the most previous uh, iteration of that law. Uh, during the development of that uh, state plan that is now required for ESSA, um, we, the department engaged over 60 stakeholders really in working groups that met to really inform the, the various uh, sections and requirements that are in ESSA. Um, at the same time, you'll recall that the state uh, general assembly uh, passed the A through F school grading uh, legislation. And so as we were working with our stakeholders, it became very clear the need to align this federal required model with the state requirements so that our stakeholders and our families weren't trying to reconcile a two different models and figuring out really what does that mean for their schools and for their students. And so it was very much with intention that we tried uh, as much as feasible to make those one and the same. So as Amy just mentioned here uh, and walked through a number of these, there are some, there are lots of things in ESSA, lots of requirements for states, but some of the key ones that, and the ones relevant to this discussion today are listed here. Uh, as she noted, uh, development of an accountability um, system and model to hold uh, districts and schools accountable. Uh, the identification of student subgroups. Uh, we know that there are six federally uh, recognized student groups in ESSA, but there are also um, flexibilities for states to include other um, groups where appropriate to ensure that you're holding as many schools accountable as possible. Uh, it also includes uh, identifying the appropriate end size, both for uh, accountability and for reporting purposes. Lots of language in ESSA around personally identifiable information and protecting student privacy, but also ensuring that the end size is appropriate enough to hold uh, schools accountable. The establishment of long-term uh, goals uh, are required in some key areas, um, EL, English language arts, mathematics, uh, graduation rate, English language proficiency uh, primarily are those there. In addition, uh, one of the biggest changes in ESSA is some, some adjustments to how we hold schools accountable and the terminology used, and you'll hear me say it several times, is this annual meaningful differentiation of all schools based on the indicators in the state's model. And we'll spend some time walking through those slides uh, as well. Part of that are also some required um, designations and, and identification of certain schools, and we will walk through those as well. Um, it's not unusual that the, the federal government requires us to identify uh, schools for improvement that uh, existed previously, but it really is around uh, a little more, um, a few more guardrails around those designations and the role of states in ensuring that we continue to hold schools accountable once those designations are made. Uh, and to Amy's point at the end, making sure that, that the, the state and ultimately districts are also um, providing supports for any schools that are identified in the state's uh, accountability model. At the highest level, uh, the accountability framework that was developed and approved as part of our ESSA plan really is grounded in growth and overall achievement, both at the all student level, but more importantly at the student group level to ensure that we are holding schools accountable for the success and growth of all students, not just that overall uh, growth score or achievement score. Uh, it is intentional that it recognizes uh, growth at all levels across the continuum. We know it's as equally hard to move a student from below to approaching proficiency as it is from approaching to proficient or on track. So making sure that we have developed a model that recognizes that as well. Uh, in addition, acknowledging those high performing and high growth schools uh, as part of our model. Um, it is also about those meaningful interventions that are tailored. Um, not every school is in the same place. 
uh, we know that meeting schools where they are and providing appropriate interventions, uh, whether that's through grant funds, whether that's through support through our core offices or division of school improvement team, um, making sure that those interventions and supports are tailored to what schools actually need. Um, and finally on this slide, making sure that in those instances where the overall school may be performing, but you have a group of students that may not be performing um, at a level equivalent to their peers, it's important to uh, recognize and support schools uh, and individual student groups as well. And so this accountability framework, the intention was to meet the federal requirement, but also to fold in some of the state requirements as well, so that what we ultimately end up with is one accountability model that meets both requirements and, and the attempt to uh, help inform um, and give our stakeholders, our families, and our communities information that they understand how to interpret. So beginning with district accountability, uh, it is the state's um, contention that our, our primary role is to support districts and hold them accountable, who then hold schools accountable. That has been our model, knowing that uh, primarily we serve the 147 districts, uh, LEAs across our state, uh, as well as state agencies, in that work, uh, ESSA layered on school accountability, uh, that also is included in our model, but really at the district level, that is where uh, our, our primary touch is to move achievement. Uh, I listed the indicators uh, here, as you have heard Amy referenced as well, uh, achievement on um, annual assessments, as well as growth, growth through TVOS. Uh, you'll see the other indicators there, chronic absenteeism, uh, graduation rate, English language proficiency, which was an addition uh, in when ESSA was passed, as well as uh, a ready graduate indicator. Um, ESSA called out specifically uh, the uh, need for us to include metric or indicators in our model that speak to other factors that may speak to a, a school. And they are called school quality and student success indicators, and the two that we have selected our chronic absenteeism and the ready graduate indicator. You will see that here, but you'll also see it in the school model. Um, moving into the minimum progress goal, uh, that is also a federal requirement uh, of states uh, to assess 95% of students, both in the all group and in each individual student group. And so that is part of our minimum progress goal, as well as ensuring that um, districts are making progress in at least a third of the grade bands and student groups in the model. So it is, it is truly kind of the first gate, if you will, to meet the 95% uh, uh, assessment and then the minimum progress across all students and student groups. The way in which district accountability is determined is 60% um, of the designation uh, would be represented in all students and how they perform on the indicators, and 40% uh, for subgroup performances. So it's the 60-40 uh, split between all students and uh, individual student groups. These were things that were discussed at length uh, to determine the appropriate weighting between all student achievement and individual student group achievement. Uh, yielding the final designations you see at the bottom, which would be uh, the identification of exemplary districts, advancing districts, satisfactory districts, marginal, uh, the in need of improvement would be those districts who do not pass that minimum progress goal, uh, again, on participation rate and on uh, making minimal progress with at least a third of your uh, groups and grade bands. School accountability, you will see some very uh, similar things on this slide uh, that are very akin to district accountability, uh, and that is very intentional. Uh, I mentioned this term before, but this is really uh, the way in which states are required to uh, annually meaningfully differentiate schools based on all indicators in their model. Uh, there are several federally required um, designations and identification of schools, and you'll see those at the top of your slide. Uh, the first two would be comprehensive support and improvement schools and targeted support and improvement schools. These are 
are calculated once every three years and are intending to identify uh, overall schools who are performing in the uh, bottom 5% and individual schools who have student groups performing uh, in the bottom 5% for those individual groups. And I'll share a little more about each of those separately in a moment. In addition to those, there is an annual uh, designation for additional targeted support and improvement. And uh, that is an every year uh, calculation and one that um, is a subset of the targeted support and improvement group. We'll talk a little more about that as well. So in addition there, we also have state accountability rankings we identify reward schools. We still uh, identify priority and focus schools. Again, uh, when the plan was developed, it, was, it meant something to Tennessee to hold on to designations that people have become familiar with using. Uh, and so you'll see a lot of uh, alignment between some of the federal terms and the state terms uh, as I walk through the, the next slide. Uh, again, you'll see the same indicators because it was important that uh, we, we were holding schools accountable uh, similarly to how their districts were being held accountable. So again, you'll see the exact indicators uh, that were on the district accountability side reflected here on the school accountability slide. Dr. Carney, I have a question. If I can interrupt yes. just a second. So I, I just wanna make sure, so if 60%, if the accountability is broken down 60% all students and 40% student subgroups, then basically we're double counting the student subgroups. I assume that's intentional? That's correct. So what, what they're trying to do is capture uh, how the overall school is performing. And so that's that 60% of the all students. But knowing that you also have, um, without that, um, the, the potential to mask individual student groups that are not performing. And so it is, it is correct that a student would good count in both of those uh, areas. And that is intentional. Thank you. Thank you. So on the next slide is just more of a summary. So again, that annual meaningful differentiation uh, has our state plan, approved state plan has both of these components, uh, the federal uh, differentiations of comprehensive support and improvement, targeted support and improvement, additional targeted support and improvement, and then the state uh, designations you see underneath with reward, focus, priority, as well as the A through F school grading system that was passed by our General, General Assembly. So all of those pieces, again, trying to um, reconcile all of this into a single plan uh, was really important to our stakeholder groups. And so um, I, won't, I won't stand here and say it's not confusing and it can get a little muddy at times, but important um, as we think about our end users to make sure that we have a single model by which to evaluate how our schools and uh, students are doing. So let's talk a little bit more about comprehensive support and improvement. Um, I included here, it says priority versus comprehensive support and improvement. Because uh, when we wrote the plan, it was intended that these would be one and the same. Uh, the lowest performing 5% of schools across all indicators in the model. And so uh, as, we, as we were developing that plan uh, and we were working with um, the U.S. Department of Education, we also had something happen in Tennessee that required us to differentiate these two lists, at least right now. You'll recall we had 1718 suspension of testing uh, and there was le legislation passed that, that required no adverse action for schools. So that happened here in Tennessee. At the federal level, we were required to use 1718 data to identify comprehensive support schools. So for this cycle only, we have a subset of comprehensive support schools in addition to priority schools where those 17-18 uh, data were not used. So the ultimate goal by the next time we run the list uh, would be that these are one and the same uh, to address that uh, issue. So uh, you'll see at the bottom the current numbers that we have uh, across these two groups uh, required of, of uh, districts that have comprehensive support and improvement schools would be a, a, an LEA developed plan holding districts accountable for how they will support their lowest performing schools. Uh, support from the department, whether that's through lots of school improvement grants, um, root cause analysis, other uh, 
interventions through our core offices uh, and the like. Uh, that is re also required uh, in the uh, Every Student Succeeds Act. One of the key changes was really around these evidence-based interventions. Um, in the past, when we identified schools, they were required to implement one of the four federal turnaround models. This uh, actually pushes more of that responsibility down to states and districts, uh, and there are certain tiers of evidence that are required in your comprehensive uh, and targeted support uh, schools. Uh, tier one would be any intervention that is based on an experimental study. Uh, tier two would be uh, any, uh, w at least one study uh, that would be quasi-experimental showing uh, positive uh, impact. Uh, the third uh, tier would be a correlational study um, showing the same. And so those are the three levels of evidence that are required if they are using federal dollars to support turnaround uh, in their identified schools. There is a tier four um, level, but those are not uh, acceptable uh, for our lowest performing schools. And just th those are things that are kind of promising. Perhaps there's um, a qualitative study underway. It's maybe local research based on local context. But again, uh, for our schools that are identified, it's the top three tiers that are required. Uh, and again, currently 16 uh, schools across our state have only that CSI designation, but you'll see the overlap. We have 89 uh, total comprehensive support and priority schools that the department supports. When we shift gears to targeted support and improvement, this is really not about to all school performance, but really around the identification of schools that may have a student group that is performing within the bottom 5% of that same student group statewide. I included an example because it can get a little, a little crazy on this one. Um, so for example, if you had a school that had an economically disadvantaged uh, subgroup and that school's subgroup was in the bottom 5%, of all schools across the state with that same subgroup, that school would be identified as targeted support and improvement for that economically disadvantaged subgroup. I will add let, that. Let me, let me make sure I understand that because I've, I've got a yep. got a question. So if if that school was performing, say at the fifty percent level, but that subgroup was at the five percent level, then that school would be a a targeted support. That's that. correct. And um, it's really about looking at those individual student groups, those six federally mandated uh, ESSA groups, uh, to make sure that the school is taking care of and, and holding them accountable for all students. Uh, sometimes what we see often is a school that may have one subgroup, like ED or economically disadvantaged. What we often see is that sometimes it's multiple subgroups within the uh, student groups within the same school. They are still considered a targeted support and improvement school for any subgroup that is identified in that bottom 5% of the pool of ED student groups across the state. Does that, if you're identified as a targeted support and improvement group, does that allow you to get grant money or extra money or, or what, what does that, other than putting the school on notice that they've got to have improvement, can they get additional funds because of that? Well, they would be eligible for, um, based on what's in the law and what's in Title I for, for that school improvement set aside. The concern is that we have, you know, right now 89 priority schools that really are um, probably, um, not to overuse the term priority, are the funding priority in, in that subset of schools. What we have done historically is we have uh, supported targeted support and improvement through kind of more of a service model, providing resources, support, um, supporting the district to make those changes um, for those individual groups of students. We've also increased our capacity in our core offices to ensure that um, students with disability, English learners, um, other groups of students have um, more regionalized um, resources available, uh, and that's often happening from the department across all of the teams at the agency. 
but they are eligible. But historically, um, based on the amount of money we receive uh, in our Title I allocation and that's set aside every year, uh, there simply isn't enough to, um, to meaningfully uh, award funds for uh, targeted support and improvement schools currently. Thank you. And you'll see there's 147 of those across the state, uh, not in any uh, truly uh, across all of the districts, across I think 40 plus districts across the state. Dr. Carney, I have a question. So the, the districts complete an annual performance improvement plan that is submitted to the TDOE. Those groups, the, 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 I'm sorry, are you going to say something? No, go ahead. I thought I heard you. So these targeted groups that uh, they're working on, let's use your example. Um, so they're working on their plan and they have to submit to you what that plan looks like to where, where how they're going to move these students forward uh, and move them out of the lower lowest percentile. Um, so does it, did you say the core office works with those districts to see how those plans are progressing or, or is there a, a check-in periodically and other types of supports that you can share with us that they provide. More Absolutely, more that's, a, that's a really good question. I will say this, uh, it's something that we have struggled to think through, like what is the right service model? When you're talking about, in many instances, one individual student group rather than what I would call whole school reform. So it's, uh, um, Mr. Edie's point, it may be that overall the school is doing well. It may just be that you have a group of students that need more attention. One of the things that we do at the department, because we want to ensure that we don't overcommit our core offices to do things, uh, because they support in so many other ways around district planning, as well as implementation um, supports throughout their, their subset of districts. So one of the things we often try to do is support districts through our Division of School Improvement to have those discussions to say, um, with your Title I dollars, for example, um, encouraging districts to um, do an, a district set aside specific to those individual schools. Uh, so while we can't maybe award a separate grant to a TSI school, we do have districts that do set aside for identified schools so that they can provide that additional support that will come uh, and try to help move the achievement of that specific group. So there's support coming from um, the Division of School Improvement. They had met with, uh, had individual district meetings with any district that had either targeted or additional targeted and support uh, schools, as well as aligning those supports through our Division of Federal Programs and Oversight to, uh, encourage districts and make them aware of the uh, opportunity to do a set-aside specific for those identified schools. Okay. Well, I asked the question because I was thinking, as you just indicated, the uh, resources of the core office are fantastic. I know they do great work with their respective districts, and I do think they could be spread very thin. So I, I would also imagine, too, that districts may not necessarily need additional supports and that they have targeted and they have their resources that are coming to bear to address the challenges. But if it continues year after year, I would think that there would be some other interventions that would occur, especially if their status changes from um, what's the, moving from. If the next slide is, you are, you are teeing me up for the next slide. Uh, very good. I'll turn it back but to you. No, then. You are exactly right. You are exactly right. And in addition to the, the items I just noted, we also have uh, personnel in our special populations division who also develop resources specific to students with disabilities, uh, English learners as well, because often what we have are um, we are seeing a large uh, influx of English learners across our districts, and districts are really struggling with how to meet those needs. So trying to support districts that are maybe serving English learners for the first time and how do they do that uh, both from a personnel perspective but also as a resource. Uh, we know that English learners spend about 75 to 80 percent of their time in the gen ed classroom. So how are we aligning our supports to gen ed teachers to support um, English learners, for example, which would be another uh, subgroup example there. But to, as you perfectly set me up uh, for this next slide, um, this is one of the things probably I appreciate most about the, the Every Student Succeeds Act. So it's not just about 
you identify a school, and so something is expected both from the district and the state. But if, if you continue to underserve certain groups of students, they become this designation, which is additional targeted support and improvement. Um, you'll remember this is an annual designation. So every year we're che checking to determine are they making headway with those groups that were that TSI group of 147? And this group is a subset of that group. And so what differentiates this group is two things. The first would be um, if the performance of a school, let me try it again. If the student group were a school, it would be performing in the bottom 5%. So these, to me, are the elevated school that I would say, uh, if something doesn't happen, will become the next priority school. They are they are in that space uh, where they're currently. So that if they were, if that student group were itself a school, it would be in the bottom five percent across the state. So uh, very uh, serious, very dire situations. And to your uh, point, uh, Chairwoman Hartgrove, this is. This is the group where we have issued additional grant funds uh, for the ATSI districts, trying to ensure that they have those additional resources, that they are implementing high quality instructional materials, that we are in their buildings, in their classrooms, uh, to ensure that they don't become priority schools. And I will say that it was probably some of the best feedback we got when we were developing this plan was the comment from one of our members that said, why would you wait for a school to become a priority school before you do anything with it? And so really trying to make sure that we are uh, equipping our ATSI schools uh, with supports from CORE, uh, as well as our school improvement division. Uh, those are things that we've shifted within our agency to free up capacity to do that um, uh, across our CORE offices. Uh, if they continue, to underserve that same student group, if that district does for three consecutive years, it will automatically become a priority school. And so that is another kind of accountability, both at the district level and the state level, to ensure that we are prioritizing our support to schools who are in uh, this additional targeted support and improvement category. So can we go back and look at the, I'm, I'm, I'm struggling with the difference of definition between an additional target support and target support. So a school uh, with students perform in the bottom 5% of all eligible Group. across, across the state. Correct, but it's only uh, the ED subgroup. So if you think right. about it to say, we're gonna take all of the ED subgroups. So any school that has an end count of 30, that has a student group that's economically disadvantaged, that becomes your pool of schools for the economically disadvantaged group. They then pull the bottom 5% of that pool, and those are the targeted support and improvement schools for economically disadvantaged. You're going to have a 5% a from students with disabilities. You're gonna have 5% of the English learner subgroup as well as the combined racial ethnic subgroup of Black, Hispanic, Native American, and any other school, unique school that's ca captured in all of those six federally required groups. So in that sense, you're, you're, you're pulling out all of the eligible student groups across the schools, and then you're selecting the bottom 5% of each of those student groups. Okay, now go forward and, and show me the difference for the additional. And so the difference would be, from that subset, so you had 147 targeted schools. From that subset, they look to see is if any one of these, whether they were ED, SWD, English learner, or other, uh, if any of those by themselves, that their performance is such that if they were a school, they would be in the bottom 5% across the state of all 1,700 uh, schools we have, or 1,817 schools we have. So it really is to highlight a school that, it's not just that they're underserving uh, a group of students, it could be that it's very close uh, within those student groups, but they're saying that this subgroup is, is performing so low 
that if it were a school, it would already be a priority school. So it's intended to really elevate that set, and we have 37 of those currently. And, and you said there were was were grant funds, or there are funds available for those schools. That yes, sir. That is how we have approached that um, in the past by offering. Um, what we call ATSI funding, as well as um, high opportunity school literacy grants, as well as uh, the opportunity to ensure that all of our schools have uh, high quality instructional high quality instructional materials being implemented uh, in those classrooms. Uh, of late, we've been working with CORE to think through um, how do we also uh, ensure that this subset of schools. Um, are being supported by what CORE is already doing uh, in a number of their other buildings, but really ensuring that this group is uh, part of those supports as well. So that, that really helps me understand a comment that uh, I got from a district uh, superintendent uh, visiting their school not long ago, uh, who I guess was a TSI school, which you said doesn't get additional funding from the state versus an ATSI, which can get additional funding. And they were saying that they were sort of in like purgatory because they couldn't get, but they're, it's because there's not enough funding to go around uh, and hopefully the districts can help them out. But that helps me understand that comment and, and better understand what we're talking about here. Thank you. You're welcome. And just for context, um, Tennessee's uh, S Title I allocation, which is where those grant funds come from, there's a 7% uh, set aside for school improvement. And uh, for every year, that equals about, ballpark, unless things change, around $22 million a year specific for schools identified for improvement. So, again, we have approximately 90, bottom 5% would be around 90 priority schools, 137 TSI schools, and then of those schools, uh, 147 TSI schools. And then of that, these 37 additional targeted support and improvement schools. So. Really, it's it's about trying to, um, sometimes with the TSI schools, just the designation itself uh, will, in, will and, and some of the supports around using your Title I as a set-aside uh, for those schools will help, but in other instances, you know, much, especially in schools where there's maybe more than one student group identified, uh, that, that more support would be needed, and that's uh, where we try to direct those uh, resources. So the next slide, and I think we're almost finished, you all have been great for, to hang in there and talk about ESSA all of this time, I appreciate it. Um, and Amy alluded to this as well, is there's a great deal of require, several requirements around um, transparency and reporting. And uh, a lot of those report card requirements around assessment results, uh, accountability determinations at the district and school level, as well as uh, district demographic information, other data that includes things like post-secondary enrollment, educator uh, qualifications, um, lots of information, and, and the report card, I included the citation there because it's very heavily mandated as to what must be included in the state's report card. Um, of particular note and new to ESSA and very controversial is this per pupil expenditure reporting requirement that is uh, around um, being transparent around the federal, state, and local dollars going to individual schools. And so what that's doing, uh, as we've been working, Marion Dursky on our team has led um, a working group for a while to really try to support districts in this amount of information being out there and how to uh, help families and other stakeholders interpret it. Because what's coming to light would be uh, potential um, discrepancies uh, in things like um, staffing, funding, building, uh, quality of buildings, et cetera. Uh, and so there is certainly uh, a, a lot more information out there on funding, uh, both, again, I mean, again, federal, state, and local uh, out there for stakeholders to interpret uh, as part of one of the new ESSA requirements. They did maintain other pillars, as we call them, uh, in the law, which would be supplement, not supplant. They changed the test a little bit but maintained that pillar, uh, as well as comparability and maintenance of effort. Those are things that Secretary DeVos or, uh, would not have the authority to waive for a district or a state. There are other waivers that can go forth to the Secretary for consideration. However, these are not um, on the table for that. 
finally, there is a requirement for a resource allocation review uh, for any district that has uh, comprehensive or targeted schools, making sure that districts are giving those schools what they need to be successful. And it's oftentimes not just money, but it's access to certain uh, courses, high quality teachers, um, other things that really speak to um, ensuring that students in those schools um, have what they need to be successful and that the district is being uh, equitable in how they are distributing resources uh, to uh, those individual schools and districts. So lots of transparency reporting here, but one that really is, in, is grounded in equity for all students. You see it in the model, you see it in these additional uh, reporting requirements as well. So um, happy to take any other questions now or in the future. Uh, this is quite a lot to take in uh, from all of this, but, but more than happy to talk about it uh, now or whenever. Any other questions for Dr. Carney? Thank you very much. For me personally, this helped explain a lot of questions that I had, thank you. You're the most welcome. I hesitate to ask this one. This is Sarah, but um, just in terms of our communication and um, where we'll need to head with the federal government around any flexibility related to our ESSA plan, obviously we have an election coming up in November and that may change or not who we're dealing with, but could you just talk about sort of how you imagine communicating with the federal government around anything related to accountability and the timeline that you would see on something like that? Even the sequencing with our state legislature and the, you know, the actions that they may or may not take. Sure. Uh, I think that is one of the things that are part of those ongoing discussions that the commissioner mentioned. Uh, one of the things that we expect uh, and what I have done in my time uh, at the department and in my engagement with the U.S. Department of Education is really uh, once some of those key conversations happen to continue to begin some early discussions about what that would look like uh, for approval. I think it was in Amy's slide that you know, our accountability to the U.S. Department of Education is our ESSA plan, and so there would, would need to be uh, adjustments or changes made there um, unless there's a, a short-term waiver situation. Again, uh, all of that would be subject to the decisions, uh, and we've had to go through that in the past where we've asked for waivers for things that have happened um, because our legislature, you know, implemented um, a, a law that it did impact our federal reporting uh, and so we had to go through that process, but um, that is something that I would I would think would have to play out within our state first, and then having those early conversations, kind of engaging them more as a partner on the front end to help us think through, uh, so that once we um, fully submit, we've already had those crucial conversations in advance uh, of that happening. But uh, I think there's a little, you know, as the commissioner noted, those things are ongoing uh, discussions that would then inform all of the things that would need to change in our plan to, to, to meet approval. No, thank you for that. I just I think it's helpful for anyone listening in to those of us that are spending time sort of in the weeds on this right now, recognize how interconnected all of these decisions are. And as Amy and the commissioner both said at the outset of this call, you know, there are a number of sort of decision making authorities that we'll have to sort of sequence and think through in terms of state legislative action, the federal government needing to give permission if, if things were to change on accountability this year. And so I think just even thinking about the fact that um, our legislature won't come back into session until January, February, and as you said, there's going to be a need to sort of sequence and consider the actions that they take with what we would need from the federal government. And then just the fact that you're having ongoing conversations and keeping that um, communication open to understand what their process would look like, I think is important to understand for the public and others watching in. Um, it's not something that happens or turns on a dime by any stretch of the imagination. It's further complicated by, you know, an election. <laughs> Absolutely. And just for, and I should have included this earlier, but just for reference in terms of what this plan yields for our students, yeah, just for the Every Student Succeeds Act, it's close to 400 million a year. And that doesn't, you know, there are, components of that that speak to our um, uh, IDEA and other indicators, but but just for the ESSA programs, you're, you're right at 400 million a year that is tied to this uh, plan. You, you referenced earlier the Georgia request for the waiver and the denial. Uh, I presume that you're in constant contact with other states and what they're doing, or is there a group there or 
or I mean, so it's not just not just Tennessee. Oh, certainly no. I think every state is grappling with this right now. And I and just to be clear, the one thing that 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 the secretary noted was that these blanket waivers would not be considered. I do think um, that was something that was very responsive um, to the pandemic early in the spring, uh, but that um, states have been pretty much put on notice that that's not going to be a recurrence. And so really thinking through um, how we do communicate with other states, uh, that there are several groups that work together and have regular calls uh, to, to try to stay on top of what is happening in other states and where other states are, uh, if they get a response from the U.S. Department of Education that's shared more broadly so that, uh, because we're all grappling, you know, with the same issues right now. Thank you. Next. Thank you. Uh, good to see you all in in, um, in virtual. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about stuff that I don't think I can say better than than Dr. Carney and and uh, Amy, who set who teed up this uh, this topic of annual measurable objectives. Uh, this is a requirement. Uh, that this is like the Tennessee implementation of a federally required component of accountability systems and and basically the uh, Every Student Succeeds Act. As was mentioned earlier, uh, the state board, you, got, you all have uh, the approval of these annual measurable objectives or AMOs. And I'd like to take some time today to just remind folks about what they are, uh, how they're, how we, how they've evolved over time, so AMOs are the measurable objectives that are set annually for districts and schools within Tennessee's accountability framework. And uh, we set those AMOs individually. So for each school and district and for student groups within that school or district, um, using the most recent available data as the, as the starting point for setting these goals. And so that that is something um, that is important to highlight that we you know we believe a lot in the, the local context and so our AMOs are individually set. Uh, additionally, AMOs represent the amount of improvement we would expect in the previous year if we were to decrease by half over eight years the percent of students that do not meet the expectations. So that, that technical language, we'll talk about what that actually means, like how that's done in a later slide. So I don't want you guys to get hiccup, like caught up in like, what does it mean to degree by half and eight years of percent of students? We'll, we'll do that in a second. Um, but by setting these individualized goals, AMOs help districts and, uh, districts and schools focus their efforts on uh, their students, their own unique contexts, um, and that is always important and especially more important this year when they have so many unique um, challenges that have just come up in this unprecedented year. Um, so AMO performance areas are the indicators or the places where we have AMO targets that we set. Uh, obviously, in assessment, um, we set these, uh, these objectives for our TCAP assessments. Uh, we also set them for chronic absenteeism, graduation rates, ready graduates, and English language proficiency. And um, the ready graduate indicator is used with schools, and the English language proficiency indicator is used with districts um, for creating this, this individual performance area. So what do we mean when we say we close a performance gap by one half by half in eight years. So if we imagine that this is a school uh, over the course of eight years, and that the graph on the far left would be like, say for example, this year, you know, the, the, uh, a, starting, a, a starting point year, the most recent year. Now, if they were at, at about 40% proficiency, kind of like the chart is showing, on, say, their TCAP, and 
the goal would be like 100% of the kids are proficient, so 100%. So what is that, the halfway point between that 40% and the 100% is around 70. So that's the target that the school is, is uh, that, that these goals are aimed to support closing in eight years. Uh, so what that would look like is each year, you can see there's a little like up arrow and a little line. We, they would use that year's information to set a target um, for the following school year. And it, and it all goes, you know, as, as schools and districts apply this and um, uh, kind of use their resources and strategies to address gaps and improve these areas, we would hope that over eight years, we would see that gap be reached. So close that gap in eight years. So that's currently how these are calculated. When you look at this um, kind of scale, uh, you will hear things uh, in, in the past about like double AMOs. And all that is saying is that little arrow, it's just twice as twice as tall. That would be the equivalent of a double AMO. Um, so that was a quick rundown of kind of the, the, the calculation, and we can return to it, but it might help to uh, look at kind of what has, how AMOs have evolved in Tennessee. And um, if we could advance to the next slide. Great. So here's kind of the context for how AMOs have come about. So they may have existed prior to No Child Left Behind. I didn't actually go much further, but when No Child Left Behind was passed, um, there was a, a requirement that these goals were set. So um, in, starting in 2002, 2008, um, we had AMOs that were set for schools and districts, but they were all the same goals for everybody in the state. Um, we had goals that were for achievement on our TCAP. And these, these targets changed every two to three years, uh, kind of with not, not necessarily uh, consistently, but in, in a way, but like intentionally moving them forwards and upwards. Um, and additionally, there we sat, we had in Tennessee, AMOs for attendance and graduation. And those were set to be 93% attendance uh, of all students for uh, schools of kindergarten up through eighth grade, so elementary and middle schools, and then a graduation rate of 90% for high schools. And those numbers did not change uh, over the course of the, those years. Um, and then we move into the 2009 to 2012 time period where um, where there were some changes uh, and uh, into interpretation and requirements. Uh, if you've heard folks talk about um, uh, AYP, what a AYP may, used to be, it's often this time period that it's being referred to. And that's annual, it stands for annual yearly progress. Uh, and it's partly because during this time period, again, we had goals that were um, set, approved by the board, uh, and they were the same for everybody. Um, and the achievement uh, goals were set, but they took a baseline year for everybody, um, then set the targets each year. Uh, and it wasn't to close the gap by half in eight years. It was to close the entire gap, so the whole thing, in five. And so that's pretty uh, pretty dramatic changes each year. Um, and uh, the attendance and graduation goals, they remained constant, so they just stayed at 93% and 90%. Um, but there was the addition of targets to measure um, different student groups and the, the, the difference between perhaps underprivileged students and their counterparts. Um, from there, we transitioned into, um, in 2012 and 20, to 2015, um, individualized goal setting. 
as as perhaps the kind of the uh, the, the approach may not have been appropriate for every school or district. So from 2012 to 2015, we only had um, district specific goals created, and districts would then uh, set school goals locally. Um, and so for during those times, we had uh, we introduced what I showed you on the previous chart, which was closing that performance gap by half over eight years um, by subject and grade. Uh, but during this time, there weren't attendance and graduation AMOs that were um, submitted to the board, but other targets were, including gap closures, kind of like what we talked before um, in the, the 2009 time period. But this time, it was based on the measure of closing that gap by half over eight years for each student group. Um, beginning in 2016, and this would be uh, in line with much of the stuff that Dr. Carney was talking about with our ESSA plan. Um, we then, and, and also to, to, ESSA also requires that we have these goals for schools. So we've been setting uh, since that time for schools and districts, uh, school and district specific AMOs for our achievement targets. They are the same in terms of closing the performance gap by half over eight years. Uh, we reintroduced graduation rates and, and instead of regular attendance, chronic absence, which has been shown to be significant uh, in, in, the kind, in, in knowing and understanding to be able to provide effective interventions to students. Um, and, and additionally, we added uh, an AMO for ready graduate and an AMO for ELPA. And that has been the kind of the, the trajectory and how they've kind of evolved over time. Um, but I mean, there, there's there's a lot of things in there. And but all in all, I, 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 AMOs are about making sure that districts and schools have a, a goal that is that meets their um, individual criteria and context, so they can make good decisions on behalf of kids. Mr. Hardy, I have a quick question for you. Yeah. So, uh, according to this, we would be about halfway through uh, our way to the to the eight year goal. So, once we hit the eight years, what what next? Yeah, so, is the current eight year cycle. Yeah, yeah. So that is the that the eight year. Um, Closing the performance uh, gap by half over eight years is it's just states about how big the AMO is. Now the goal is what you just said that in eight years we would we would achieve that goal. Um, right now it doesn't look like like it, we may may or may not achieve that goal, but we still need to set individual targets for schools because some schools and districts may have uh, you know close that gap. By half in eight years, and some others maybe not, and they they still need that kind of support. But at this time, like I don't, I, I can't really speak yet about what's ahead because we're still we're still figuring out um, a lot of uh, using the best available data and and getting feedback from stakeholders about future needs, and and we'll also be able to talk about that, you know, as as we know and understand more. Before you move on, just a quick question back um, the slide prior to this in terms of closing the gap now in eight or you know, closing it in half in eight, eight years. How do we think about 1920 versus 2021 in terms of what year that would represent and what progress we're looking for from districts and schools in terms of gap closure? Can you clarify that just a little bit? Yeah, Does that make like 1920 versus 2021. I mean, we are right, still basically the fact that we didn't have data yeah. last year. What does that mean for like what year we're in essentially as we think about the AMOs that would be coming to the board this year for 2021? Yeah. So the department's currently working to finalize AMOs for the 2021 school year using as, as 
all the available data that we've got and the way that will best serve test these students. And, and we're prepared to make some recommendations on AMOs for approval in that upcoming November board meeting. Um, at which point we will have perhaps more specifics about how, how we should interpret this, uh, like, because your question's a good one. It's, it's like, where, so where does it fit in this unusual time period? And, and it's just important to stress that, um, you know, while AMOs, that AMOs while, will be brought to the board in November, um, you know, there may, like, we are still trying to understand the, yeah, we are trying to still understand um, best from our stakeholders, from our data, how to interpret the current year and what's, what's going to be most helpful, you know, to, to students, because that's what we're doing these for. So it sounds like we're not quite sure yet in terms of what would come to the board, whether it would be sort of the same goals that would have been, or the same AMOs essentially as districts would have had last year if we had data versus whether they would change at all based on the fact that we're, you know, another year down the road. Yeah, I, I mean, we've definitely given a lot of, of, of thought in, about this. Um, yeah, we've definitely we've definitely given a lot of thought and consideration. We do have some some pretty clear ideas, but then they're not finalized. And so I, I I don't want to be putting the cart in front of the horse yet. But I mean, very soon as we will be approaching the November, um, we're I mean we're going to be using our most recent data. We're going to be using what we know, and um, still working to finalize. So. Okay, and I don't know if our board members have feedback as you're thinking about that, Nick, as an educator, Daryl, but, but that's something that I think is um, going to be important to understand as it comes to us in November. And then the other point I just wanted to make, and you touched on this, but just to sort of double down, you know, if you think about accountability and where AMOs typically would fit in an accountability framework versus this year, again, not knowing where the state legislature and any work with the federal government will land, how are you thinking about the communication around AMOs to districts? this year at this point in time versus how to get like what what districts might interpret amos to mean in any other year yeah okay. and that's, that's still part of i think no the question is spot on it's something that we are are thinking through and wrestling with um and it's 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 part of this question of like we we need it to best serve students we need it to match the the to match its intended purpose of helping to move students, like student outcomes forward and being individualized to districts. And so, you know, how, how we finalize these using the best available data and understanding will inform a lot how that communication needs to take place. The ideal world, uh, going back to Nick's que question, is that we would have these AMOs, and then every year, uh, schools or districts would be evaluated against how they meet the AO AMOs, and that would go toward the accountability. So, next question: What next? If they don't meet it, they're going to see that in their accountability score, their A through F grade. Correct? Yeah, um, yeah. What's, but, what's but happened? This, go ahead. Yeah, but this year obviously is an unusual year, and so you're looking at how to factor that in at this point in time, and then what AMOs you're going to use this year. And I think the issue, too, is that the, the districts want to know those AMOs as soon as possible, and I'm glad you're going to bring it to us in November, because they know that's how they're going to get evaluated, and, and you know, they don't want to wait till February to find out how they're going to be evaluated for the year. Actually, um, Vice Chair Evie, that actually tees up exactly sort of what I was going to say. Um, this is Charlie Buffalino from our Policy and Legislative Affairs team. I think it's important context for board members to realize, too, that while the AMOs need to be brought in November for exactly that purpose that Vice Chair Eby just noted, and that these are goals that schools and districts need to have and keep in mind as they progress through the school year, in no way does that preclude any action that may be taken by the legislature and federal waivers on accountability that we've been talking about. So this doesn't prevent sort of those changes in any other sort of way if there's going to be any movement on that front to sort of circle back to what was said at the beginning of the meeting with Commissioner Schwinn and with Ms. Owen's presentation. So just wanted to underscore that point as well.
And I, I do want to add, add that I think everybody's hearing this from the school districts, at least I, I have in my area in the Upper Cumberland, that they've already been determining for themselves what those AMOs are. So they're not waiting, and they never wait because they cannot wait. They want to be working on those AMOs now. So they're going off of previous data to determine what they think it should be for this year. And clearly, we need to provide that as soon as we can, and, and I'm glad we're going to see that in November. But we all know this is never soon enough for them, so they do have to do their own calculations to, to set the targets to start working on where they want to be. Um, and with that being said, I, I don't know if there's any logic behind uh, conversation through to toss and getting input from the districts themselves during this unprecedented year that we keep talking about to, to get gauge their feedback on this. And I know the clock is ticking and November the 4th, 5th, whatever date we're meeting is going to be, I think it's the 5th, 6th, it's going to be here before we know it. So I'm just thinking input from them if you have not already received it, I think would be something that should be considered. Charlie, what Is that being done? Or are you thinking about it? Mike, did you respond? Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. Um, my, your comments are right on on target, and yes, being done. Yeah, and just to clarify, I mean, we are in regular conversations. We've been getting that input pretty regularly through a lot of different engagement groups to take that into account. Um, you know, I think I think they're, the, the board generally looks for sort of input sort of once the items are presented to you as well. So I think that will be ongoing, and there certainly has been a lot of that outreach that we have done um, up to this point, and we'll continue to do so moving forward. Thank you. All right, now we've got a quick update on our fall EOCs. Um, and our EOCs, I mean, this is, I want to talk briefly about it. There are numerous uh, districts across the, the state who have block scheduling. And um, so what these fall EOCs represent is the, the basically it's the TCAP test for those high school courses that are on a block schedule. So that means that their course ends at the end of a semester. Um, and can we, yeah, so these high school courses, um, and these are right now they're English 1, English 2, uh, Algebra 1 and 2, Geometry, Integrated Maths 1, 2, and 3, Biology, and U.S. History. Um, these are the tests that that are on block schedule and that we've, we've got um, paper tests and they are ready to go. We're working a lot with districts to understand their needs uh, and wanted to share out some of the, the things that we've heard from districts a little bit on some of the challenges that we're, we are working with them to overcome. Um, you mentioned that grading is a challenge and that's something that I, I think uh, Sarah brought up a little bit earlier because um, there is a SBE rule that requires scores be used for 15 to 25 percent of students' grades on these assessments, and um, and we will we we are will do our best to make sure that scores are back in time. But districts definitely have um, challenges about okay, what does that mean? As this is the first year we've had a setup like this, or we've had students that are or virtual and others that aren't, and what if they miss it? Um, so there's there's a bunch of questions that, um, yeah, that they are struggling with around around grading flexibility, and and they're looking looking for flexibility there. They're also looking for flexibility based on delayed semesters. We had some schools that with a delayed start and a delayed semester end, so like ending in January instead of in at the end of December, and so they're. The grading is a challenge. I understand the 15 to 25 percent, you know, what that's going to be. And, and it, but grading is a challenge because how to grade people who've been on a virtual class versus uh, in class or hybrid class. Is that what they're saying by grading is a challenge? Or uh, I don't understand what you mean by that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, we've heard a lot of different reasons for why they, they see grading as a challenge. I think it's a lot about the 
the uncertainty um, there, and and it it leads into one of these other bullet points as well, which is um, you know participation. What if what if the students aren't are they can't get the students to come in, even though it's that's federal. That's, that really doesn't that that really isn't. I'm trying to think of relevancy of that to the end of course exam. That really is separate from the from the grading of the end of course exams. Which oh no, coming, yeah, coming in to take the test. Okay. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Right, yeah. uh, and and so they're they're trying to because you know for high schoolers, um, if the grading policy, if there's something different about the you know if if, if the buyer or the the way that they offer services is better the second semester than the first. You know these kinds of grades may affect uh, class rankings and valedictorian things. There's, there's just a lot of things that they're trying to navigate, and they don't have um, like yeah. And they they at right now they're going to have to um, assign grades. And I don't know if if I can say say one, they don't all have the same reason for wanting flexibility in grading. So I, I don't think I'm doing a great job at representing all of the different voices right now. Um, but they, they all know that it's something that, um, that if they had some flexibility, they could focus on some other things and, and, um, and be able to adjust kind of for the unforeseen circumstances that are, that come ahead. Let's see, Bob, can I jump in for a second? So we have in previous years where there have been challenges with assessments, updated state board rules to allow LEAs to factor EOCs into student grades, not on the current scale of between 15 and 25%, but between zero and 25%. So if an LEA felt like they had challenges administering the assessment or there was something difficult going on about that year, um, they could hold students harmless, essentially, and say that the EOC score will not factor into your final grade for the course. That's definitely something that we want to look at for the November board meeting, because we may have students who are, for example, in their senior year fall semester, and they need to be getting transcripts out to colleges. They're making post-secondary decisions based on what their GPA could be. So that's something, um, Sarah and Angie, you're also welcome to jump in here, but we do have a history of doing this. For grades K-8, it is required in law that there's a percentage of the um, TN ready that counts toward a student grade, but for high school EOC courses, it is in state board rule. So there's a couple of things to consider there, but I did want to let the subcommittee know that's something that staff are looking into, and we'd be really interested to hear your feedback on that idea. Yeah, I, I understand that, and I think that's certainly something that we ought to look into. What I was trying to understand is the districts appear to be having a challenge overall in grading, not just in the course. And what this would do is this might help, you know, up to 25% of it, but the districts still have an overall challenge in how they grade in a situation where they got some students in virtual, who, some students who can't come in and do this, some students. So I was just trying to differentiate, you know, what we're, what we're looking at here, so thanks. Yeah, oh, great questions, uh, and and yeah, I mean this is challenging for everybody, and and we are as a department we're currently looking for solutions around some other places where they're looking for flexibility, uh, flexibility uh, based on the delayed semesters, like I mentioned. We're looking into some solutions for that, and we're going to release some guidance soon, uh, and looking into support and flexibility within test windows. Um, cause the logistics and the management of, of assessments is a complicated thing, and it gets even more complicated with COVID and, and some of the, like following their district health protocols and things. They are worried about participation and that one, um, ESSA has a 95% participation requirement on the, on the statewide assessments and, and they do worry about, well, as I mentioned before, um, yeah, what about, what about kids that aren't going to be, aren't coming in even when we say it's time to come in to take the test? Um, are they so the worries are 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 real, and, but that's one of those things to start at the very at the very top with with Amy's presentation. That's that one's inside federal law, and um, it's so, so if we don't meet if we don't meet that ninety five percent for ESSA that requirement, and they don't give us a waiver, that could impact the funding that we get from the government, or what's what's the impact if we don't meet that ninety five percent? 
Dr. Carney, if you're on, you're probably the most appropriate person to, to address that question. So yes, I was. I heard the question, and I was getting, trying to find all the right buttons to unmute. Um, I think there could be, uh, under normal circumstances, I would say, uh, not uh, meeting uh, the state. We we in the past have been able to um, submit waivers for individual groups of students, perhaps that didn't meet 95% of participation rate. What we would be seeking uh, potentially here could be a little bit broader than that. So um, so long as the state takes the appropriate action here, um, we, we would likely, um, because of the current state and because this is something that every state is, is facing right now, I think that U.S. Department of Education will have to find ways to work with states who are trying to address and who are trying to assess uh, so that we know where kids are, so we know how, um, what additional supports are needed to address learning loss. So to me, it's going to be part, um, as I mentioned to Dr. Morrison, part of that proactive conversation, uh, especially as it relates to fall and of course assessments and others. Um, but it is something that um, if we weren't in the middle of a pandemic, uh, it certainly could put resources in jeopardy. However, I think um, they understand the state uh, that states are in and districts are in and will work with us to, um, they're going to ask that we have a plan and they're going to ask to know what we are doing uh, and those will be the things that will happen in those conversations in the coming months. And to be, and thanks, uh, thanks, Dr. Carney. And to be clear, like to to each point, these are part of ongoing conversations. It's not that we we know that's a requirement. And we we have the obligation to to help districts meet it, but these are definitely parts of ongoing conversations that we are having at having mm -hmm. various levels. Because these are flexibilities that we we know that they need, and we're working to try to find solutions for them. So, it'll do. I would like to speak to um, to some of those issues, I and mean, we're we're getting ready to face some of those, even though they are with required tests. Um, at our school, we give the pre-ACT, um, which again is not a, a state assessment, um, but it's one we choose to give to our students. And so we're in the process now of figuring out we have. And our, it's an eighth grade test. And so we're in the process now of figuring out how do we take a third of our students who are currently virtual and then bring them back into our building, those who choose to do so, which we feel confident that, that many will. Um, we simply don't have the space. We don't have enough rooms. We don't have, um, you know, logistically following the schedule. We simply don't have it. So we're trying to be creative um, and figure out if we have you know, half of the 70 or more, where are we going to place them? And is this something that we're going to have to do over more days? And so I'm glad that those conversations are going on because all schools are going to face this at some point if we continue with testing, especially the spring when most everyone is going to begin testing. Um, you know, where, how do you safely administer a test when you're trying to keep your, your student numbers low in your classrooms and in buildings where every inch of space is being used, you know, how is it going to even be possible, um, especially when we have a, a window that we have to, to administer that test in. So um, look forward to hearing that. And, and Mr. Hardy, are those conversations, I would hope, also taking place as far as spring testing, because that's going to be the one that's that's even bigger, because the fall testing really just focuses on, like you said earlier, the block schedule, high school EOCs. Whereas as we administer TCAP and high school EOCs, those are going to be, you know, thousands more. Oh man, you nailed it because we know we we know that first off, no state knows how to do this. And so we know there's a lot to learn about how to best serve in spring with even more testing going on. And so we're we're keeping our ear close to the ground and, and you know, be, be having lots of conversations with district testing coordinators to make sure that we are are being as responsive as we can, learning and um, and hopefully we can we can make testing even better if there are and help districts not feel stressed about these these worries and challenges uh, for spring. Um, but definitely, we've got lots to learn, but we are 
we are definitely working to make sure that they have flexibility that then some of the support that we can we can offer them. Interesting example of a linkage between federal and state systems. So we have that 95% requirement in ESSA, but it's also, as Eve mentioned, in our district and I believe school accountability frameworks as well. So if it's waived in one place, we would also need to look at all of those kind of triggered chain reactions that take effect next. A lot of stuff going on, a lot of, uh, a lot of things to consider as we go through the next uh, uh, few weeks and, and few months. So uh, good meeting. Uh, Sarah, do you have any uh, final comments? Not so much comments, just, I just would like to pause and see, you know, Nick, Daryl, Lillian, Bob, are there other questions that you had over the course of the meeting that we want to spend some time discussing? I do think, as you said, Bob, there's still a lot of decisions ahead of us as a state on both testing and accountability. And so I would expect that we'll want to bring this group back together to have some more conversation as we get a little more clarity from the federal government, as we work with legislators, you know, as we enter legislative session. But um, certainly just want to pause and see if there's any other things that uh, board members in particular want to bring up for discussion now or to put a pin in as something you want to bring back to this group later. Carol, just one question related to our upcoming um, board meeting. Are there any um, ongoing sort of COVID-19 response measures that we're taking up or anticipate taking up? Um, one of the questions will be what we just talked about with fall semester EOC courses and whether they should count towards student grades. There might be a few remaining COVID waivers. Um, we get the items from the department on Monday, um, so our staff will start reviewing them then. I'm trying to think if there's anything else from our side that'll be coming through. Um, Angie, feel free to jump in if I'm forgetting any, but there's none that are immediately jumping out to my mind. The other one that I would add, Amy, is we are considering bringing an emergency rule regarding continuous learning plans to basically cement that those continuous learning plans would continue in effect through the end of the 2020-21 school year. Um, so that is really just a technical trying to tie those up for the, through the end of the year and make sure that they remain in effect through end of 2021. That's because as well as um, emergency rules are only in effect for 180 days. So the current CLP emergency rule would actually expire at some point in February. Um, and as much as we'd all like this whole situation to be over in February, that may not happen. So we need to make sure that the rule has basically an extension um, through the end of the academic year. Give us a, a kind of an overview of how the districts are doing uh, with regard to COVID, thinking about these attendance rates, meeting the requirements for the six and a half hours a day, how they're, how they're tracking those um, issues like that. Will we get, is that part of the overall department report or should we ask for that or? That we know that we've had the commissioner as a regular feature at our workshops talking about COVID related um, work and challenges over the past several meetings. As part of the CLP rule, there was a requirement for the department to submit to the board a report on CLP implementation, I believe by the end of this coming February, an interim report, and then at the end of June 2021, an overall report on how implementation went um, and some statistics and information just like you were requesting. Helpful if for our workshop, if we could get a just a, a status assessment of where that is. I know uh, I and probably the other board members get lots of comments from our districts throughout and uh, just kind of knowing the challenges that are happening and, and, and how the other districts are, are facing those challenges and, and any data that we have, I think would be very helpful in the workshop. I don't know, Chairman Hartgrove, what do you think? 
that's a given that we should have that opportunity provided. Absolutely. The, the other thing that I, that I want to add, and it, it's just to, I, I don't know if it's putting a, a bow around it or not. Um, you know, we have, we have our responsibilities. The department does, the state board does, and I think we have a good collaborative effort. I said that earlier in the conversation. At the end of the day, the districts are out there. The schools, the educators, uh, everybody, families are, are all still uh, deeply worried and concerned about their, their children and their safety. Uh, safety comes up all the time in conversation. And there's still a lot of fear about accountability, and you know a lot of our conversation today is around all that. And so we cannot make any of this happen fast enough. And we all we talked about the roles and responsibilities earlier in the process. And I just want um, to be on record as saying once again, you know, if I could have, if we could have made it happen yesterday or many months before, I know that we, we would have. Um, and I, I want everyone to understand that there are certain things that. We have to be patient um, as much as we want it to happen now. Um, and we know it's hard while they're out there and teachers are concerned about if they're doing their best uh, job, struggling in some cases with hybrid, doing both at the same time, teaching in person and teaching virtually. So there's so many things that are going on out there. And I never want us to lose sight of recognizing that. And so they're waiting for the state. They're waiting for leadership to help them in a lot of these things. So I just want them all to know we are working on it and we, we'd like to make it happen already. So that's what I want to say. But in terms of uh, of the board, I, I think, uh, you know, Amy and our team, they're working very closely with uh, Charlie and Mike and all the others at the State um, Department of Education. So uh, nothing else for me as far as any, any additional workshop items, at least not as of today. Uh, but look forward to any presentation that helps us guide our work and the decisions that we make uh, every time we come together as a board. So thank you all for that. That's a, a perfect segue into what I would like to say. Um, I just wanted to update the board and let everyone know that I will be introducing a resolution uh, at our next meeting. That's in the, process, the final process of being drafted, um, or, or I would have shared it today. But, um, you know, my hope is that teachers know, just like uh, Madam Chair said, that we are working, our teachers, our students, administrators, districts, um, that we want to support them. We understand the situations that they're facing in all of our districts. And so in that resolution, I'm going to be asking for the board to take a, a, a stance of support and understanding that this is, is not a normal year. Um, and our, the resolution, resolution would ask the General Assembly to waive those um, accountability requirements that are tied to assessments for this school year. Um, we feel like moving forward with testing is important because we didn't have that data last year. Um, and as we have, as all of us know, um, with the learning loss, um, that has occurred across the state. We really need that information. So um, that is not a, a resolution asking for testing to pause. We would get, move ahead with testing, but the accountability piece would be for this school. Year. And so I, I think it was important to have that discussion today, what our roles and responsibilities are, because we uh, simply can't waive those ourselves. But in working with the General Assembly and, and others, we hope that that would be waived for this school year. So I feel like it's important for us to move forward take a stand um, where, you know, and let everyone know uh, our feelings. So I will introduce that resolution in a few weeks. Thank you. I, I think it's important uh, to say, again, as we go through these roles and responsibilities, it's not just one organization that's making decisions here. But as you can see, whether it's the federal government, whether it's the state government, whether it's the uh, TDOE, whether it's the state board, whether it's the local districts, every, there's a lot of lot of uh, organizations here that have um, important roles as we move forward to again uh, provide a better education for our students, and and that unfortunately takes time. It can't be done in a vacuum. And I think the key behind that is we've all got to continue to communicate and work together as we are and probably step that up if we're going to make this in a, in a timely manner. And so, um, you know, just keep on doing what we're doing, but let's let's increase those communications is what I say. 
Any other comments? All right. Sarah, do you have any final comments now? <laughs> no, no, I was just going to reiterate what you were saying, Bob. I'm uh, really appreciative to this group, to our partners at the Department of Education. I agree. I mean, we are just, as everyone knows, in unprecedented, just the most challenging of times. And I think in education, um, we feel it acutely. And there's just still a lot of decisions ahead of us. So I look forward to additional collaboration and communication and navigating it together. And I'm grateful to all of you for your time and attention today to some of these issues. And I think it was important sort of foundational information for all of us to kind of ground ourselves in the decision-making authority, the different uh, actors that will need to come together to make some of these decisions in the, in the coming months and look forward to getting back together with this group in particular to continue discussion about all of those things. But nothing else for me right now. Thank you, Vice Chair E.B. and all the rest of our board members. Thank you very much. It was a great meeting, and, uh, and uh, we'll talk to you guys later. Thanks. Meeting is adjourned. Take care. Thanks, everyone.